this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Today on the Life Science Success Podcast, I'm interviewing Leslie Loveless. Leslie is the CEO of Sloan Partners. Her career journey has led her from Takeda Pharmaceuticals to Quest and now as CEO of Sloan Partners. Sloan Partners is a premier executive search firm that specializes in recruitment for life sciences, biotechnology, diagnostics, data and analytics, and laboratory testing services industries with offices nationwide, including Boston, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, San Diego, and Research Triangle Park. Thank you, Leslie, for joining me today. Can you tell us um, a little bit about yourself? Absolutely, Don. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. And I'll just start with a, a brief introduction. As you said, my name is Leslie. I'm the CEO of Sloan Partners. We are an executive search firm really focused in serving early stage and growth stage companies. I've been uh, with the company going on 15 years, and I can't believe I'm saying that, but it is in fact true. And it has been quite a wonderful, amazing ride. I just on the personal front, I am based in the Midwest. I'm married and I have a daughter who will be 14 on Friday. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're getting to that stage in life where they're, they they definitely need to start planning kind of their next steps as well. Does she have an interest in biotechnology for the future? She is a math wizard and she believes that she will, her dream is that she will go to MIT and to engineering school. So that's what she tells me and I'm all for that if she can make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in your career, I heard that you started out actually as a school teacher. So after being a school teacher, what led you to work in life sciences? Sure. It definitely is not a traditional path to where I am. And I always joke, I, I, I work in the sciences, but I am uh, definitely not a scientist. I have an undergrad and master's in English, and I can diagram the heck out of a sentence, but the science and math side of things, not so much. But anyway, I did love teaching, and there's nothing like being with students and feeling like you're making headway and having a positive impact on their lives. But I, I think I got to a place where I just felt like I couldn't see myself going into a classroom and spending my day in a classroom all day, every day for the rest of my life. And I tried to figure out where else I might be able to take the skills that I had developed in front of parents and teacher, other teachers and students. And in sales, it's a lot about building relationships. It's a lot about education, whether it's a product or a service or whatever the case may be. It's about teaching about what you have to offer. And so that was something that I think worked pretty well as far as what my experiences had been to date and pretty transferable actually to what you experience as a salesperson. So that's what led me there. And it's just been one exciting thing after another ever since. Yeah, it seems like there are a lot of transferable skills between the training as well as sales where you can spend a little bit of time investigating and questioning the different things and concepts. It seems like you you also further on in your career, right, both at Takeda as, as well as Ameripath, you are a sales trainer in both of those roles. But tell us a little bit about that as well. Yes. So that, it definitely was coming full circle back to teaching. It was just teaching adults and educating them about the products in the portfolio and how to talk about the company and the process of selling and all of those uh, sorts of activities. But it, it was still teaching. It was really interesting because I, when I went to Quest, I actually didn't end up being in sales for very long at all because I went to training class and they didn't have a trainer. And it just was kismet, I think, that it worked out that I went there at the time that I did and I enjoyed it very much. It was a, a really great experience working with adults and teaching in a different format. Yeah, so how do you make the transition then? So you you were in education, then you were in more or less sales training or also in sales, and then now all of a sudden you're focused much more on recruiting. So how did you make that transition and what sort of led you to Sloan Partners? 
Yeah, connections make everything happen. And so I'll go back to how I ended up at Quest Diagnostics and tell you about Adam Sloan, who is the founder of Sloan Partners. This was way back when Adam was just starting Sloan Partners 21 years ago. And I was one of the early people that he placed in a position and we hit it off and stayed in contact. And there were different periods of time where we engaged over the course of a few years. And at one point he asked me if I would ever consider moving over to a startup and doing something different like recruiting. And at the time I, I didn't really know how I felt about that because I hadn't done that before. But then there came a point in my life where I, I really had to think about things differently. And that was when I adopted my, my daughter that's 14 that I mentioned at the beginning. She is adopted from Guatemala. And when I was in the process of adopting her, it became very clear to me that it wasn't going to work for me to live out of my suitcase week in and week out. And Adam and I reconnected and the rest is history. So I've been here ever since. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to see how you build your network and then how you can leverage that into the future. And I do think our networks are critical really for anyone in the space, especially as you're trying to look for new opportunities and new, new situations that might actually overall help your, your overall life, work-life balance as well. Absolutely. And we've built a virtual company at Sloan Partners and we have people coast to coast, a lot of people in the core markets of life sciences and healthcare, and it's worked really well. And I, I can't stress enough how lucky I feel that I had that relationship with Adam and that he and I found each other at a point in life where it was an amazing career opportunity for me and also so worked as in terms of supporting my desire to adopt a child and to be a mom. So it was just a beautiful thing. Yeah. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit over to the clients of Sloan Partners. So overall, I've looked on your website. I've seen that, that you have clients like Path Group and Mammoth Biosciences, definitely clients that people that listen to the podcast should know. So what defines a typical client for Sloan Partners? Sure. We work in life sciences and healthcare, and those two sectors have a lot of verticals underneath them that put different types of companies in one category or the other. And when I break down the types of companies that we support, as far as the specific types of products and services that they offer, it is largely biotech companies, the drug innovators, life science tools companies, data and analytics companies, genomics, medical device, and then a fair amount also on healthcare and clinical services. When you look at the industry companies that we support, there are a couple of elements that are pretty universally true, regardless of the sector. And that is that our clients are primarily startup, early stage, and growth stage companies. They are a lot of them, I would say a high percentage of them are venture capital or private equity backed, but we have a fair number that are also public companies. Many of them have gone public throughout the course of our partnership with them. So that is one element, just that the stage of company that is fairly consistent in the organizations we support. The second piece that is again, generally true across the board is that our clients are the most innovative, the most disruptive. They are not me too companies. They are leading edge in whatever their focus is. And they are looking to disrupt the market, to change the world, to change healthcare. And so the, that is the other piece that is pretty consistent in terms of our client base. Yeah, it definitely is something that's needed in the overall space. That then, especially at this point in time, there's a lot of inflection points right now for life sciences, especially you know with with COVID. And their breakthroughs in terms of drug development, there are definitely breakthroughs in terms of device development. And having leaders that help to support things as companies evolve is definitely important. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so much fun. What we do is so much fun. It is brutally hard it, and the competition for talent is unlike anything I've seen since I started in recruiting. It is tighter than ever, making it just a challenge every day, but it is so fun to see 
everything that all of our clients are doing to watch the news and to see that an approval happened or they got a breakthrough de designation or, and we get to sit back and go, oh my gosh, we were part of building that team. It's just tremendous. Yeah. And I guess the back to one of the statements that you just made, right? So in terms of finding talent now with COVID and things like that, I've heard that the job markets are starved for people right now. Are you finding the same thing? A hundred percent. I'm truly, it is the tightest market I have seen since I joined Sloan Partners by a pretty wide margin. It is very difficult. And there are pretty solid explanations for why that is. And it comes down to the fact the investment community is very high on life sciences and healthcare in general. There's a lot of money flowing into those markets and there are a lot of new companies. It seems like I'm reading about a new company every single day, the seed funding or series A funding that they got to advance the mission. And with all of these really exciting companies with strong investment teams backing them, there are just a lot of opportunities to be had for the best talent in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. And I really have to respect a lot of the job that, that teams like yours have to do as well in terms of finding, especially niche talent that you can't as easily, you know, locate and then in a tough job market as well. It must be just both exciting as well as challenging at times. Absolutely. There is never a dull day in recruiting. And I always say to our, our team and when people are interviewing with us, it is not for the faint of heart because it, our product is people. And people are not like machines. They are not consistent. They don't do the same thing over and over again. They have feelings. Life happens. And like it or not, people will disappoint you and break your heart sometimes. And it, it happens in recruiting. And so you have to always have plan A, uh, plan B, plan C. There's just got to be a follow-up action if what you want to happen for one reason or another doesn't. Yeah. Absolutely. So you co-authored an article in the California Business Journal titled Encouraging Trends Emerge as Life Science Companies Str Strive for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So what can you tell us about the trends in the DEI space? Sure. So as I address this question, I, I do want to back up for a moment, just give you an explanation behind the genesis okay. of for that and how it came to be. Of course, as you might imagine, for a few years now, there's been a lot of, of um, discussion around hiring diverse talent, but the last year and a half really brought that to a, a lot of a lot of discussion, a lot of pressure, a lot of just sort of recognition that things needed to be different and we needed to do something about it. And if you don't do something about it with intention and, and not let up, it won't happen. And so one of the things that we were seeing in recruiting is a lot more emphasis and conversation around hiring diverse talent, whether that be hiring a female or hiring a person of color, a lot more discussion about that. And what I wasn't hearing is what happens after. So it was all about filling this space but not discussion about what do you do beyond that to ensure success, to ensure inclusion, to ensure equality. And actually it's been almost exactly a year since our executive director of DEI joined us. And funny story there. So Candace Norte is our executive director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. She is a career educator. She got to be a director of education in a very large school system. And ironically, she used to be my student back in my first life when I was a teacher and she and I reconnected and she's just spectacular in every way. And the impetus for us hiring Candace was that we knew that if we were going to deliver on filling positions with diverse talent, that we needed to also support our clients and the industry in general in educating them about not how to just hire a person, 
but how to hire a person and create a, a system internally that supports that person, includes that person, and allows that person to excel. And so that's what Candace's role is. And she and I were together in the co-authorship of that. And that's really what it's all about. Yeah. So it's interesting to me because one of the items that I pulled out of this article really was around that same sort of concept, right? This whole idea of, of having people in a position at a promising startup is fine, but also you have to have things that make them feel welcome as well. And so what are you seeing that companies are doing to ensure that they have sustainable, inclusive workplace culture? This is where Candace's services come into play. So she's got a lot of engagements going right now with clients in life sciences, as well as an engagement with the Boys and Girls Club of America, where she's doing some consulting for them on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So what we know um, from these experiences to date is that companies are forming commit. They are doing more than talking about how they need to hire diverse talent. They are building programs internally. They are holding workshops. They are doing training sessions. They are hosting book clubs. And Candace is a very important part for many of our clients in helping them figure out where to start, because that can be the very um, difficult part of building a DEI program internally is like, where do you begin? And she's helping them with that. But there are a lot of companies now that are hiring for that position of truly owning DEI and figuring out how to make it part of the fabric of a company and not just something that a, an HR leader is trying to do in his or her spare time, because this is not a spare time job. This is a full time with intention, very important part of our future. And so we're seeing a lot more emphasis put around real programs and real people owning those programs. Wow. It's amazing because I've been in several companies where you see that all of essentially diversity, equity, and inclusion are definitely a part-time job for lots of different people. And so to hear of that shift is an amazing difference and it should have a big impact overall in the space and the companies that, that make that shift. Yes. Absolutely. I, I, it's exciting. It, it feels good to see it happening. It really is, is very inspiring to see all the conversation that's happening and leaders stepping up and taking a stand and working toward a better way of creating a, an industry that reflects reality, that reflects our population. Yeah. And then, so with COVID, what have been the big, biggest challenges that some of your clients have faced in the past year? Yes. Yeah, so unlike us, most of our clients are not 100% virtual companies for 20 years. The biggest challenge, I think, just in general, was figuring out what do we do? How do we do this? And who is an essential employee that still has to keep coming to work so that we can keep our labs running and keep the discovery work going versus who can work remotely and how do we figure out how to make that feel fair because it doesn't really feel fair when you've got half the company working from home and half the company reporting into the office every day and how do you make it safe and give that confidence that everybody's doing the best that they can and all the right things to protect their peers and from a hiring standpoint just the idea of hiring people especially executive level recruits without actually shaking hands without being in the same room. That was fascinating to watch that unfold. And it happened. Executives were hired without ever traveling to the location that they were moving to and um, going to start reporting into an office that they'd never seen and have a boss that they'd never met in person over video. Yes, but it's just different. And so figuring out how to be comfortable with that was the biggest twist, I think, for everyone. And how do you envision that they, that the people fared, right? So you think things turned out 
um, fine, even though it's, it's unfamiliar? Or do you think that the not shaking hands or not seeing the office that you're going to report to cause some sort of a, a significant gap that we're eventually going to have to deal with in the space? You know, I don't think it did. I'm sure there are exceptions, but we haven't seen that. And we place a lot of people and throughout 2020, we placed a lot of people that did not meet in person. And we have not seen any unusual spikes as a result of that. So I, I don't really think that it created the problem that many might think that it could have or should have created. Americans are tough, they figure it out. And we did. And I, it was interesting to watch it in real time because back, I would say the April, May time period, that was really the only segment of time where we were thinking, okay, what's this all mean? What's going to happen here? And how is it going to impact us and our business? It was like a two month period. And then it was pants on fire because I really think the whole industry went, okay, we have a pandemic and now what do we do? Okay, we do this. And then it was just everybody back at it and here we are and we're still going strong. And that's just, sometimes you just got to figure it out. Excellent. Yeah. And, and, and it, from my standpoint as well, I, if I rewind the clock back to April, I was saying there's no way we're working from home. There's no way they're shutting down the highways. And next thing you know, we were working from home and you had to have, you know, some sort of special letter, at least in Colorado, where I'm at to even be on the highway that would indicate that you were an essential worker having to go to work. And I do feel like we really did figure it out in the last year. So then if I fast forward from then, then from April to August, though, then you also wrote another article titled Sustaining the Life Sciences Boom in California. And we certainly saw a lot of companies shrink their way through the pandemic. What was the inspiration for the article from your perspective? What made you write that article at that point in time? Yeah, the main point is for us as a healthcare and life sciences search firm, California is a critical market. And San Francisco, San Diego, and many places in between, I, it is just a, a hotbed of innovation and opportunity in life sciences and healthcare. And the main idea, and I, I stand by this still today, is that I do think that, that in these major markets where California is, is, it's interesting, it's the hardest place to get people to leave, but it's also very challenging to get people to go to California. So within California, it's very important to protect the ecosystem, to create an ecosystem that feeds what you need for the future. And so part of what we were getting at there is the need for connections in academia and STEM programs and figuring out how to drive talent and a pipeline of talent that can continue to feed this amazing system of opportunities in California. And we're always thinking at things from the talent standpoint. We're always thinking about, okay, where are these people going to come from? Because the companies are coming faster than the people are coming. And so the point there is just trying to get California the, the companies, the academic um, institutions, everybody working together to figure out how to support that growth engine and keep it strong. Yeah. Yeah. And I may definitely have seen it even in Colorado because we've seen a lot of people that were in California that for different reasons decided to leave and, and join our biotech sector as well. And then we for sure have different areas across the country where we could focus things. One of my favorite quotes from the article was that life science leaders must begin to think like investors think. Investors see a clear ROI in those businesses that combine the right technology, vision, and people in their business plan. Um, is it enough just to have the right technology without a smart game plan and the best leaders to implement it? And I just really enjoyed that overall quote out of the article because I think it, it really shifts your mind frame from thinking about 
the way that, that you might center your thoughts around the execution of things, but now thinking instead of those people that are investing actually in your business and trying to help it grow. Because we work so much with venture and private equity partners, it has been very educational for me in the last 15 years to better understand how they think. And I've also had the opportunity to be present in uh, different pitch sessions for entrepreneurs that are coming out of academic discovery environments and so forth, and really hear how they talk about the science and also hear how the venture and private equity investment community responds with their questions and what they're looking for. And in the end, it's all about the the 360 do you have it all because they really want it all because it's so much easier to argue for the the capital and to make the investment if it's all there versus a major project and an overhaul of people and we need all it and there's always some level of needing to add a CFO or maybe you have a scientific founder who really doesn't want to be the CEO, wants to be the CSO or the CTO, and then you need to bring in a CEO that can grow the organization, get the product ready, bring the company to a commercial state. It's just been fascinating to, to learn how the minds of the investors work and what they're looking for when they evaluate technology. Yeah, absolutely. And then for Sloan Partners, what are some of the goals that you're working on for your clients in 2021? Sure. Just in general, I'll make a blanket statement that diversity is at the forefront of everyone's minds. So I truly don't think that I have a single new business or launch call where that conversation doesn't happen. So that in and of itself is a big part of the discussion, whether it is around planning for diversity, a strategic thinking around how to attract diverse talent or actually doing the recruiting work, that's far and away at the top of the list, okay? Now, beyond that, I would say there are a few key positions that are just really tough and on everybody's minds right now. One of them is finance leaders, chief financial officers, and our clients are always looking for sort of one of two profiles, either the person that can lead the IPO or the person that can lead the capital raises. And I take a company through series A, B, C, whatever the needs are, the plan is. Um, that is a, an area of high demand. So supporting their needs and identifying financial leaders is huge. CEOs also, because there's so many exciting companies that they just need the right leaders to get them to the promised land. So a lot of C-suite work a tremendous amount of board searches. So again, going back to the diversity point, there's a law in California and there will be other laws in other states about diversity and clients are preparing for that. Now, public companies, they are there are mandates for public companies in certain areas, but uh, private companies are planning for it because they know that if they get to the place they want to be as a public company, they need to be ready for that. Those are a lot of the big projects for us right now. Absolutely. Very important work. So there are three questions that I like to ask every guest. What inspires you? I think this is a, a, a very timely question, given that the Olympics are uh, going on right now. And that is that I am always inspired by the underdog, like the person that just gives it their best and comes from behind and is successful. Like that brings me to tears. I love it. There's nothing that makes me happier than seeing that. And with that comes just people who are committed to excellence and delivering excellence in whatever they do. That inspires me. Yeah, it's been great to watch. I normally watch my last few minutes before uh, before I get ready for bed. I try and, you know, take a peek at, at how we're doing in the Olympics. And, you know, it certainly has been a challenge for them to try and get over to Japan and compete. So I'm glad that it's even happening. What concerns you? 
So I'll break this out into two, one personal and one professional. On the, I'll start with the professional. On that side, just because of the business that we are in, I always worry about what's around the corner as it relates to the economy and will it stay strong and all of those sorts of things. So those are things that I, it's just part of leading a company and being involved in a space that over the course of history can be volatile at times, investment and such. So that was something I think about. On the personal side, I would have to say what concerns me is living in a time where I I see a, a lot of arrogance and intolerance and impatience just in general. And I, I wish that people could slow down, think things through very carefully and before putting certain things out in the universe. I I just would like to see a little more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Very important, especially whenever sometimes you could be your own worst enemy and just push a button a little too quickly. Yes. So what excites you? So what excites me about the field that I'm in is that I am amazed every single day by the work that our clients do. It is mind blowing the brilliance in the exchanges that I'm able to have with people. And I have learned so much about so many things because of the amazing minds that are part of the client organizations that we support. So what excites me is all of the breakthroughs, all of the innovations, and the fact that I get to watch this play out and I get to look for the press releases and someone that we placed is quoted in a press release about an approval through the FDA or it's amazing. So those are things that I just can't get enough of. It makes me so happy. It has to make you feel a part of it as, you know, as well in placing the talent there. So yeah, I, I would agree. It would, would have to feel tremendous to to. to feel like you're having an impact in terms of the minds that are working in the space. So Leslie Loveless, thank you so much today for spending time with me. I greatly appreciated the opportunity to speak with you and I wish you all the best at Sloan Partners. Thank you so much, Don. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast or tell a friend about it, and last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again.